Can people hear me online? Uh, hello. Yeah, my microphone icon is blinking. So, um, okay, so our next speaker is Peter Blue, who's talking about convolutional complexity approximation and classification. All right. So, uh, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, this is the, the broad topic of my uh, talk today, but basically, to be absolutely honest, it's really just two talks in one. I'm going to be discussing these two papers that I wrote during my, uh, my PhD. Um, and they're sort of roughly related, but not that much. So let's not pretend uh, that it's one uh, a coherent topic. Um, so here's the plan for today for, for my talk. Uh, in part one, I'll talk about approximating Kolmogorov complexity, and that, that sort of touches on, on quite a few questions and, and topics that came up yesterday. And part two, I'll talk about the second paper, which is about separating structure from noise in a sort of Kolmogorov complexity style. And then uh, I'd like to indulge in the, the, the final few minutes of my talk if I uh, manage my time uh, well in uh, thinking a little bit about what's happened since. So these papers are from 2014, 2015. So a lot of it, uh, a lot of stuff has happened in, in machine learning and in uh, AI since then. And um, I think we can sort of go back to this and there's actually some, some interesting questions, some interesting uh, stuff to do now. Um, which I'll uh, I'll finish up with. But first, let's let's talk about approximating Kolmogorov complexity, which is this paper. And the motivation is very simple: Kolmogorov complexity cannot really be approximated. So I'll, I'll make that more precise later. But basically, it's, it's really difficult to to uh, there's a lot of no goes about uh, approximating Kolmogorov complexity, and yet we do it all the time. And we, authors are in the room today, um, usually just by figuring everything out with Kolmogorov complexity and nice formulas, and then removing the Kolmogorov complexity and plugging in Lempel zip or, or some other compressor. And it does work. To be fair, it does work. Uh, so something's going on here. Why, where is this sort of gap? How can we explain this theoretically? How can we make this more precise? That's sort of the, the motivating question. Um, we need a few preliminaries. We've heard a lot of explanations of Kolmogorov complexity already, but I'll just go through very quickly um, more to set up my notation, which specific version of Kolmogorov complexity I'm using rather than to explain it. Uh, so the idea is we have a collection of Turing machines or other computable uh, uh, functions, but, but let's stick with Turing machines. They are enumerated. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so we have each of them has a little number that indexes them and we feed them a program and something comes out or nothing comes out and they keep running forever. Um, so that's our family of Turing machines. And uh, in the context of this paper, these are prefix Turing machines, which basically means that the set of inputs that result in the uh, Turing machine spitting something out or running forever is a prefix free set. So no, None of these inputs is the suffix of another, is the prefix of another of these inputs. The simplest way to achieve this is to make your Turing machine uh, give it an input tape and um, allow it only to read from left to right on this input tape. So once it's read a bit on the input tape, the, the read head has to move to the right and it has to read the bit next to it. Uh, and then you can be sure that if it holds, it's not going to hold on any other string that has that prefix because it holds on that prefix. That's the point in it's moving from left to right where it holds. It's the simplest way. There's lots of other ways to define prefix uh, Turing machines, but uh, this is the simplest way. And these, this is our prefix. Uh, this is our Turing machine model. What we do then is we take this index, we prefix encode it, that's what the bar means, just some kind of standard prefix encoding of the uh, integers. And we stick the program after it. So we're basically encoding the pair of the Turing machine together with its input. And that's another uh, string. And then we can define a Turing machine, a universal Turing machine that takes that input and then uses it to simulate uh, the running Turing machine I on program Q. And the important thing here is that U is now also a prefix Turing machine. So we're basically taking uh, two code words from different prefix free sets. I and Q are both from prefix free sets. So if we concatenate them that together, there's also a prefix free set. So U is also a prefix free Turing machine. 
So it's also in the, somewhere in this enumeration, uh, U itself also occurs. And that's important, this prefix U property. Um, we'll see later. But for now, uh, we define the Kolmogorov complexity basically as on this Turing machine, uh, this universal Turing machine, the, the length of the shortest program that produces X is the Kolmogorov complexity of X. So far, so good. Uh, the next thing we need to do is to turn these Turing machines into probability distributions, or more accurately, semi-measures. Um, and the simplest way to do that is simply to feed it random bits until it produces an output. So we have this read hat, and basically we don't fill the input tape with bits. We just wait until the Turing machine starts to read from the input tape, and at that point we flip a coin and we put a random bit on there. And at some point it's going to spit something out, or compute forever, uh, and thus we are sampling from a probability distribution. And all, the set of all Turing machines gives us all probability distributions that we can computably sample from. Uh, we call them semi-measures because with some probability, the Turing machine is gonna run forever, so we don't actually get an output. So the total probability mass of things we can sample is actually less than zero. Um, and simplest way to think of that is in, in this kind of prefix tree. tree. So basically, you start here, the Turing machine does some computation, it reads, you feed it a random bit, so you either go left or right in the tree, it does some more computation, uh, and it uh, reads another bit, and then you go right in the tree, and so on and so on, and you can basically draw the whole computation of the tree as a graph. And that shows very neatly that you're basically just uh, uh, defining a probability distribution. Uh, and this class of probability distributions is equal if you're interested to the uh, lower semi-computable lower semi-computable semi-measures, which are usually defined in a slightly more technical way. So we, as a bit of housekeeping, we showed that this, for our purposes, simpler ways is equal to that. Uh, so you end up with this expression here for the probability of seeing X coming out of this process for a given Turing machine. And now you can talk about the description length of X for this specific Turing machine in two different ways. First, you can say in the style of the Kolmogorov complexity, the shortest description is simply the length of the shortest program on this Turing machine that produces X. But you can also say, well, we have a probability distribution here. And if you know your, your information theory or your NDL, then you know that any probability distribution can be turned into a code by an algorithm, something like uh, arithmetic coding is probably the most popular way of doing it. And it's a complicated algorithm, but what you end up with always is a code that gives you a code length of the negative logarithm of the probability that comes out. And if we do that to this probability distribution here, we get a different description length. Uh, and this difference is important. If you happen to have a universal Turing machine, then these are equal up to a constant. But if you don't have a universal Turing machine, they may not be equal. So I'm already running late, so let me get to the point, safe, uh, safe approximation. So we want to approximate the Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, and I said, it can't really be done. What I meant was that you can approximate from above. That's what we all do, right? You find some good description of your data and that's a approximation from above of the Kolmogorov complexity, but you can't do it to a given precision. So if you have a string that looks random to you and you compute and you compute and you compute and you cannot find any structure in it, then that's your best approximation. This Kolmogorov complexity is equal to its length. But there's nothing to say that if you do enough computation, if you're patient enough, suddenly you're not going to find some sort of very obscure way of compressing it that suddenly drops the Kolmogorov complexity down to uh, some small number of bits. Approxim approximation from below is, is uh, even more of a no-go. And even if we constrain the model class, so if we say, well, this comes from a very simple source, this data. I generated this data by flipping a coin. Uh, so there can't be anything weird happening there. It must be, uh, must be random. There's still some probability that you're generating collective works of Shakespeare or some, something weird. So you cannot say with certainty that even by flipping a coin, you're not, uh, you're not generating uh, compressible data. So even a model class assumption doesn't save you necessarily, uh, unless you do what we do here, which will equal safe approximation. 
And we basically say a, uh, an approximation of a function of the Kolmogorov complexity is safe if the approximation is correct to within k bits with exponentially large probability in k. So here's the more precise definition. So we have a, a, an approximating function L prime, which approximates L. And the difference between those two is larger than k with probability exponentially decaying in k. So basically, I, I'm, I'm allowing myself to have, let's say, 10 bits difference, but with a probability of one in a thousand and 20 bits difference within with a probability of one million and so on. Uh, and there's some nice properties. Uh, the main thing to remember is that safety is transitive. So if I have multiple approximations, A approximates B and B approximates C, if both of those approximations are safe in this sense, uh, then it's transitive. So we can say that A also approximates C. And that's quite a nice property. So this is what we're going to use. This is what we're going to use to answer, to ask the question is, uh, can we safely approximate in this sense Kolmogorov complexity? Uh, and we do still need this model assumption. So if we know something about where X came from, does that allow us to safely approximate K? So we need to formalize that. Where does X come from? So we introduce the idea of model classes. Basically we say in the simplest possible way, we say basically a model class is a subset of all of these Turing machines and it needs to be a subset that we can enumerate. So we can uh, list all of the Turing machines in our subset. This could be a massive subset, like, like a complexity class, like P space or P, but it could also be something much smaller and much more well understood, like Markov models or DFAs or, or uh, more obscure sequence models like bit neural processes, but any kind of probability distributions over finite binary strings, which includes basically anything you can do in MDL. So this is basically any MDL model class will, will fit this paradigm so long as it's computable, but that's sort of implied usually when you use MDL. Um, and then we can just, in the spirit of the universal Turing machine, we can describe a universal Turing machine for this model class, which is just the same as we saw before, but now this enumeration I here is the enumeration just over our model class. So it's all very straightforward. Um, another question, if we know that X was produced by some Turing machine in this model class or some process equivalent that can be expressed by a Turing machine in this model class, can we then safely approximate Kx? So this is all, nothing special is happening here. It's basically just a, a form of Bayes or MDL applied to, to uh, this space of Turing machines. But other than that, we're not, we're not doing anything uh, strange or unusual. Uh, the first option we tried was the Kolmogorov complexity bounded to this model class. So we just take the definition of Kolmogorov complexity, we stick the C in there. So we just find the shortest program on this model bounded universal uh, Turing machine, call that the Kolmogorov complexity of X. And turns out that doesn't work. Basically, um, so I'll skip over this a little bit in the interest of time, but basically the idea is that uh, there is a, it's basically this difference I, I mentioned earlier between the length of the shortest program and the probability mass of all your programs added up together. If your Turing machine is not universal, these two are not the same thing. And you can sort of create this tree for your universal Turing machine that blows this problem up arbitrarily. So that doesn't work. We cannot use this kind of model bound of Kolmogorov complexity. What we need to use is the probability mass of all the programs that produce X together, which is kind of like the universal distribution, but model bounded to this complexity class. And then you get a safe approximation, uh, which you can prove. And the proof looks like this. Um, you can also do it through, through Markov inequality. Um, I think this was basically gospel when we sort of wrote this down. Everybody knew this already, but still it was it seemed like a good idea at the time to just write it down. So it was written down and, and special, uh, specified somewhere, especially since there are these several keys and it doesn't always quite work. Just a quick question. So here, uh, are you saying, imagine you're generating from some computable mapping function that you already know about, mm -hmm. and you're generating your outputs with some probability. Yes. In that case, you can do safety. 
Um, yeah, so uh, let me let's, uh, yeah, uh, let me spell it out a little bit more step by step because it's actually in two steps. So first, we uh, imagine <clears throat> uh, that our what we call the adversary, so the generator of the data, is the model class itself. So we pick a random Turing machine in the model class and then sample a random output from uh, that Turing machine, and then we compress that output with uh, with the universal uh, distribution for that model class. Do we then get a good uh, approximation of the Kolmogorov complexity? Are these are computable functions, the Turing machines. Yeah, uh, everything is computable here. So it's, it's the model class just imagine some kind of uh, maybe polynomial bounded uh, Turing machines or something. And then you can show that the probability that the difference between your computable approximation here and the Kolmogorov complexity, which is incomputable, is bigger than k bits, turns out to be uh, less than two to the power of minus k. The probability of sample. Yeah, yeah, so under the sampling process of sampling from all of the uh, Turing machines in your model class. Uh, and if you know your MDL, this is uh, called the no hypercompression theorem. You basically you sample from a probability model, then with high probability, that model is going to be your best compressor. Yeah. So that's a very, very uh, unsurprising and then unspectacular result. Um, but that's not usually what we do. Usually we want to say, well, it's, uh, we need something that is safe against any member of C. We don't usually assume that a mixture over a model class generates our data. We assume that one specific instance in a model class generates our data. So if that happens, and we then use the whole model class, the mixture over the whole model class to compress it, is it still safe? It turns out yes, because basically the mixture over the model class always dominates any specific instance of the model class. So in terms of compression, the mixture over your whole model class is going to yield a better compressor than any specific instance of your model class. Uh, so I'm skipping over the technical details here in the interest of time, but um, I'll, uh, I'm happy to share your slides and you can sort of look through this stuff or it's all in the paper as well. Um, but basically to, to conclude, um, Kolmogorov complexity, yes, can be safely approximated by computable means under these uh, conditions. And really, I think in practice, what the consequence of this paper is, is that you don't necessarily need to approximate Kolmogorov complexity by TIP or, or sort of arbitrary compressors uh, or, or things that happen to be compressors. Any model, any probabilistic model you can think of basically, that you can compute is a suitable approximation. Um, so if you think like a Bayesian and you, you model your problem and you, you apply all of these tricks that, that, that Bayes uh, gives us, uh, you can all drag all of that into Kolmogorov complexity and they will give you uh, under the right conditions, suitable approximations. And that's very useful if you're, for instance, doing image analysis or graph analysis, because that's where TIFF is not going to help you anymore, right? TIFF is nice for sequences, but uh, in, in all these other types of data, it sort of breaks down. Uh, and just a, a reminder, you don't need to actually compute the actual code. That's also why these compressors are also complex, because they are actually compressing your data in a way that you can uncompress. That's not necessary. You really just need the code length. And you can make your life a lot easier if you design codes that just give you the code length rather than the, the actual code. Um, yeah, and, and just to, to uh, a question we came up against uh, yesterday a couple of times is, is why do we run into all this data that's, uh, that's compressible? Why does any of this work on the data that we see? Um, well, I'm not a complexity theorist, but I think a lot of complexity theorists believe in what they call the extended Church-Turing thesis. I think, I'm, I think I'm talking about the right one, which basically says that all the, all the universe can do is polynomial computation. The universe doesn't have any super polynomial uh, processes. Um, and if that's true, then any data that we are uh, liable to see is, is going to come from a something equivalent to a polynomially bounded Turing machine, which means that if you don't care about astronomically small probabilities and small differences in, uh, in code length to, let's say, 30 bits, then actually for anything we're likely to see, Kolmogorov complexity is perfectly computable by a very expensive process 
So I'm not saying we can actually compute it, but it is at least theoretically computable in that sense. All right. Um, so now to the tech, the paper, which is actually more technical, but I've removed the, uh, 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 there's no, no theorems or math in the slides. Um, basically, common growth complexity is very nice and it uh, works very well, it's very well behaved, but actually it has some downsides which is that the things with the largest and the smallest Kolmogorov complexity are actually the things that are in most cases least interesting, right? If you go all the way to very low Kolmogorov complexity, you get very, very simple data. If you go all the way to high Kolmogorov complexity, you get purely random data. And neither of these are, are sort of in our daily lives, the kind of data that's very interesting. Data that is interesting contains patterns, uh, moving shapes, sounds, natural rhythms, things, things we can partly predict, but that are also unpredictable. So the interesting data is somewhere in between the highest and the lowest Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, but that's not an uh, IFF, that's an if, because you can also easily generate very uninteresting data with middling Kolmogorov complexity, just by taking a random string and, and changing the balance of, between zero and ones. So there's this, recurring question in, in this field of is there some kind of function we can put on the vertical axis here is there some kind of function that tells us this data is actually interesting and one common proposal uh goes by many names we'll call it sophistication in the context of this uh, uh paper is to look at these two-part codings these representations in terms of a model and an input you feed to that model. And then to look at how complicated the model is. So if you uh, basically you look at all the representations of your data in terms of a Turing machine and a program, you can plot them on these axes. Uh, and you spend a certain amount of information describing the model and then the data given the model, which you call the residual information. So if you draw the 45 degree angle, you do sort of Pareto frontier the first representation that you're going to hit is basically your Kolmogorov complexity. This is the representation that uses the least information. So the idea of sophistication is usually to take a band of a constant width, look at all the representations in that band, because these are more or less equivalent. And then to look at the one with the smallest model information and the size of that, the amount of model information, that's what you call your sophistication. And that's a very uh, an idea that has been proposed in lots of different ways by lots of very famous and smart people, including Komogorov himself, Vitanyi twice, and a Nobel Prize winner, Murray Gelman. So very smart people have thought about this. Uh, but the conclusion of our paper is that this is probably impossible. It probably just doesn't work. Um, let me skip over this. Let me give you the, the basic highlights. Um, so there's one approach which we call index sophistication, which is just to say Kolmogorov well, complexity internally uses a two-part representation. So let's just look look at the, the program that witnesses the Kolmogorov complexity. And let's look at how many how much information there is in the model part of this uh, representation. And that goes disastrously wrong because you can define universal Turing machines like this. These are sort of perverse universal Turing machines where basically you say, I encode the number I, which represents my Turing machine in a sequence of two to the power of I zeros, then a one, and then the program. So I have an absurdly inefficiently, inefficient representation of, a, uh, of the Turing machine, but this is a universal Turing machine. This is a perfectly fine valid universal Turing machine, which gives you a perfectly fine valid Kolmogorov complexity. Um, and the way this works, the reason you still get your normal well-behaved Kolmogorov complexity is that the first thing Kolmogorov complexity will do when it has to encode a string on this universal Turing machine is to use this to represent a different universal Turing machine, which doesn't have this perverse property, and then do the rest on that universal Turing machine. That's fine. And it works for Kolmogorov complexity. You still have your, your invariance. But it means that if you look at this from a 
uh, a perspective of uh, sophistication that your model information for basically any string you want to represent this way is going to be you, the model that you use, uh, what, you, what you point to here is going to be that different, more efficient universal Turing machine. These are the sort of problems you run into when you try and do this kind of sophistication. Um, so you need to, you need to um, basically fix this. First of all, what most people do is they make the model representation more efficient. They force the model representation to be uh, basically the Kolmogorov complexity of the model. And then you get a slightly more well-behaved uh, representation of how much information there is in your model. But then you run into two other problems, which we call underfitting and overfitting. The underfitting model has basically the same problem, is that there might be a UTM among your representations. So if you take this constant with band here, um, it's possible that that constant amount of bits is enough to describe a universal Turing machine, which then becomes your model. So if it's short enough to describe a universal Turing machine, I describe that universal Turing machine and then use that one to describe my data. Um, and if that's the case, then that universal Turing machine becomes the model for my data. And my sophistication is essentially bounded because all of my representations will always use that universal Turing machine as a model. The way most people, uh, most proposals try to get out of this is by restricting the models to be total. That is halting Turing machine. So you don't allow your model to be non-halting. Uh, and that's sort of uh, uh, the standard get out clause. And what we show is that this is, is really, a, doesn't really help as much as you might think. Because basically what you can do is you can create a universal Turing machine that runs for a large number of steps and then holds. So you can take something like the Ackermann function. If you've never seen that, that's just one of these uh, ridiculously fast growing functions. And uh, that basically for anything we will see in the lifetime of the universe, this behaves like a normal universal Turing machine. Uh, the only thing where you're going to see differences in, in what are called absolutely non stochastic strings. But for any data that we are actually likely to see or actually going to see, uh, this behaves like a normal Turing machine. So this basically says that sophistication, if you define it like this, is going to be bounded to this constant length here uh, for anything except sort of platonic data that exists, but not in our universe. So that's what we call overfitting. There's also underfit, uh, sorry, that's what we call underfitting. There's also overfitting, which we show can happen if you force all the other models and you force a singleton model that only produces your data. Uh, you force all the other models except the singleton model out of this band. I'll skip that in the interest of time. And basically what we show is, is that all of these proposals are guilty one way or another of uh, underfitting, overfitting, or even using these inefficient indices. Uh, so I think I'm right at the limit of my time here. Um, so what I wanted to talk about in the Outlook, but maybe uh, uh, talk to me in the coffee break, is what we can do now that we have deep learning. So I'll, I'll uh, just if you allow me two sentences. Yeah, okay. Um, so what I wanted to talk about was, can we maybe prove that a neural network, uh, so neural networks are a model class, they, they, they fit this principle uh, model class. Can we perhaps prove that a neural network trained by stochastic gradient descent, the solution we find by stochastic gradient descent, that that is actually a safe approximation to the optimal solution, which would be the base mixture over all model classes. And then by transitivity, we uh, can show that this is a uh, safe approximation of the Kolmogorov complexity, if our data came from something equivalent to a neural network. And this is not as, as far-fetched as it sounds, because as we saw yesterday, uh, in some sense, what SGD does is, is very similar to sampling from a base mixture. Um, so I think that actually maybe we might be able to connect the dots here. 
then we might be able to say that large neural networks do actually approximate common core complexity safely. And the other thing to do is for this um, sophistication question, when we did this, there weren't any good sort of hierarchies of, of machine learning models. But now that we have deep learning, we can actually look at transformers with these transformer blocks and we can look at the difference between a transformer of 12 blocks and a transformer of 96 blocks and see um, how they behave, how closely do they get uh how many of these how much model complexity do you need to achieve your optimal complex uh, compression and what we would expect to see is that for simple data you achieve it very quickly so you don't need a lot of model complexity to compress your random data or your chessboard and very quickly you are going to get to the same complexity that a very deep model would get but for interesting data what you would see hopefully is that the deeper you go the better your compression gets. So I think uh, even if, if, if uh, the, the, this idea of sophistication doesn't work, I think the spirit of, of at least computational depth, we can still, uh, we can still do this and, and, and neural networks uh, give us that opportunity. So here's the conclusions for the talk again. And I don't know, do, do I have any time for questions or? Maybe overlap, just to- Okay. Yeah, to no, of course, of course. Uh, well, thank you for your attention. Are there questions online or just?